This is a really important community for all of us in the group all of the time. It's something that several of us have been in for several years. I really rely on these women. They're the people who pray for me. They're the people who check in and see how my week was and who, you know, know what I'm celebrating and struggling with. And I was so glad that technology tools allowed us to stay together. Being with these women week after week and talking about how we've seen God show up uh, in each other's lives and hearing, you know, things that we've been praying for for weeks or months be answered has really uh, helped me grow in faith in a season where I think I need it more than I ever have needed it before. For me personally, for my faith, I think having the accountability of the group was really important for me to continue to be reading my Bible, to continue to be growing my faith, to, to just have people that are around me that are doing the same thing. And having the group held us together individually in our faith, but also as, as a community. This is how we connect. Well, you just got a little bit of a snapshot of what happens in connect groups. When people join together and gather together and intentionally spend time with one another and, and grow with each other and love on each other and, and learn together and serve together, it is incredible what happens when we do this. And here at Summit, connect groups are one of the main ways that we grow. It's one of the most intentional things we do is we uh, spend time with one another and, and we learn and serve and worship and do these things together. After a year, uh, that was defined so much by isolation and broken relationships and delaying of things. We really want to look at this year as a year of connection, a year of hope, a year of moving forward. And we really firmly believe that one of the best ways that we can do that as a church and one of the best ways you can do that as an individual is to join a connect group to spend some time with some other people and learning together and finding out more about who you are, who God has you to be and what his plans are are for you. And we have some opportunities coming up to do that. Uh, if you were looking for a singular thing to do this year, uh, it would be to, to get into a group, to join a connect group. Um, and there are going to be a number of uh, groups that are starting soon. And what we're asking is to spend seven weeks in a group. If you're not already in a group, and I know many of you are, but if you're not yet connected, get into a group. We're going to be doing a seven-week study on how to care well for our neighbors. Jump into it. There'll be online versions. To be in-person versions and ways to get together and, and to really know how to, to care well for the people that live next door to you. And, and if you hear that, and maybe you're interested in leading your group, we'd love to help you take a step into that as well. But however it is, we would love for every person at Summit to really take this step this year. Uh, to do that, you can click the link below and we will follow up with you. And, and if you're newer visiting, I, I hope that you hear a little bit about our heart for that. And also, this could be a great step for you. Uh, we would love to get you involved in a group and get you connected with some other people here at church. And maybe you're not quite ready for that yet, and, and that's okay. We can still connect with you. There is a link below. We'd love to just find out more about you and connect with you today as well. Well, I'm just so glad to be worshiping with you today. My name is OJ. I'm the pastor at our Lake Mary campus. And it is just so great to be able to spend some time Together, we are in a series called Honest to God, where we're looking at how to pray. We're looking at the Lord's Prayer and all that it offers, both as a, a direct prayer, but also in the different ways that we pray through it and move it. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about confession. Uh, we're going to be talking about what does it look like to have forgiveness from a God who loves us so much. And, and it is just so wonderful that we have had a chance to spend these weeks together in prayer, and not just talking about prayer but praying with each other and for each other. And today, as we conclude this series together, uh, Jim Keller, uh, one of our teaching ministers here at Summit, will be joining us and teaching us today. I'm so glad that you're going to get a chance to hear from him. And the application to today's sermon is communion. Uh, we are encouraging you, whether you're at home or, or worshiping with your house church, to partake in communion today. Uh, you can find out more information linked below on how you can do that, but this is just a great way to join the church as we partake in communion together, whether in person or online and distributed out. 
Well, we're going to continue with our worship by the singing of songs and hymns to God with our band and as well as by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And if you're new or visiting, again, we're so glad that you're here. Please don't feel any obligation to give. We would just love for this service to be a gift to you. Uh, but if you're a partner here at Summit, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's a good chance you know why we give. We give out of obedience to Scripture. We give because God has entrusted His resources to us, and we have an opportunity to leverage those for His work here in our church, in our local community, as well as around the world. Uh, you can participate in giving. There will be a number that will populate on the screen, as well as uh, options linked below. Uh, we're just delighted to be able to continue in worship. So right now, let's continue to worship our God, our God who is faithful, our God who loves us very much, and our God who offers us forgiveness. Blessed is the one who's forgiven, trading burdens for sweet surrender. Blessed are the sons and the daughters who come.
Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to consider what you have to say to us as your people. Lord, as we pray in opening up our time this morning, I ask that you would teach me and all of us how to pray more effectively, how to take things before you and put them in a way that you would understand us and that we would understand you better. And as we look again at this prayer that Jesus prayed, I ask that we would be able to apply it to our lives and that we wouldn't just be able to know what more effective prayer looks like, but we would be able to experience that in our own lives. Pray that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but doers as well. And I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I pray this in Christ's name, amen. <sighs> Sermons on sin, I think are the toughest to deliver, but the easiest to apply. If I were to speak on grace or mercy or giving or chastity, some, if not many of you, would be tempted to instantly check out because that's not your primary issue. And you know at least five other people that need to hear this message or something that would be more important for them to hear than you. But a sermon on sin? Well, let me state the obvious. Uh, this sermon is for you. And more to the point, this sermon is for me. Because outside of God, no one knows my sin better than I do. Maybe my wife is a close second to that, but I'm telling you, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of forgiveness. Let me ask you a question. When did you first realize you weren't perfect, that you did things that were wrong? Uh, I can think of several instances when I was young, but uh, one, one, as I was thinking back on my youth that stands out to me was uh, when I was, I don't even know what age I was. I was probably around seven, maybe eight years old. And uh, my parents both came up as children through the depression. So my parents both were savers. They knew how to budget their money. They knew how to, to make sure that their wages stretched and provided for us and, and, and uh, they weren't spenders at all. So one of the great things about my parents is they would keep little stashes of money all through the house, just extra change, maybe some small denomination bills that they would just sort of salt away. And, and if there was a quick need for a grocery store visit, they, they could grab that and, and off they would go. And being the inter enterprising child I was, uh, it was my job to figure out where these little caches of treasures were. And uh, one day I found one of them. Uh, it was, as I remember, on the top of our refrigerator, which was not easy to get to. I had to get on a chair to look on a bowl on top of it. I found just this treasure trove of coins and small bills. I thought, oh, this is, this is money that I could have. And I began to not, it didn't take all of it because you don't want to take all of it because you don't want to let them know that you found their treasure trove. I would just take little bits at a time. And during one of my uh, little mischievous visits, one of my brothers, my younger brother, Tom, found me pulling money off the, off the refrigerator and I knew that I was gonna have to involve them as well. So I, I began to involve my two younger brothers, they were twins, and uh, I was taking what wasn't mine and I was appropriating it for my own use and on top of that, I was dragging others to come down with me. And I knew, even at that age, that uh, this isn't something I did in front of my parents. This isn't something that I announced that I did. I, I had to keep the secret because I knew internally what I was doing was wrong. It was, it was sinful. We have spent the last two weeks on the Lord's Prayer, and we have focused on this prayer because we are entering a time as a church where we are focusing on the early church and one of the great qualities of the early church was the fact that they prayed almost uh, continually as, as the, the young church began to grow and spread throughout the world at, at that time. And we focused on the Lord's Prayer uh, these last three weeks because this is a, an introduction to, I, I think, our, our study of this book of Acts. Our passage is in Matthew 6. Uh, it begins with verse 
9 and it goes through verse 13. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the word of God. So we focused the first week on God being our father. Zach, if you didn't have the opportunity to hear that message, I, I urge you to go online or in some way listen to that message because it was a good one. It was, it was focused on the fact that Jesus, when he introduced his disciples and really us to prayer, he was, he was inviting us into a relationship that wasn't a business relationship. It was a family relationship. It wasn't a relationship based on performance. It was a relationship based on unconditional love. And last week, Michael Aitchison uh, gave us a beautiful rendering of what the kingdom was and what that means in terms of how it applies to our lives. And he concluded his message in terms of application saying we need to identify with that kingdom, that we need to, to have an allegiance to that kingdom. And that should uh, compel us to be active in terms of doing kingdom activities. So this is, this is the prayer Jesus gave us. This is the template that we use for a prayer. But I want to focus uh, for our time here today on these last two verses, verses 12 and 13. Jesus says, after he says, give us today our daily bread, he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So two words really today for this message. There's two words that I want you to remember. Two words that I think are important uh, for every person and certainly every believer. The first word is the word forgiveness. Forgive us our debts, Jesus says. Our trespasses, other translations uh, translate this word as, or basically our sins, our deficits, as we forgive our debtors. Back in 1973, which is, I'm sure, a time that a lot of you weren't even born. It was, it was early on in my young ministry days. Uh, a man by the name of Carl Minninger came out with a book, and it was a book that was an instant bestseller. It caused quite a stir, and its, its title was, was fascinating. Carl Minninger was, was, at that time, one of the preeminent psychiatrists in our country, and, and to th this day, uh, there are Minninger Institutes all over the country, uh, places where people can go for emotional healing. Uh, and they do wonderful work. Carl Minninger wrote a book entitled, Whatever Became of Sin? Miniature predicted that sin would be replaced with words like illness, disorder, dysfunction, syndrome. And the human condition would be explained simply as a product of biochemistry, environment, experience, and trauma. And he projected that crime would go unpunished and explained away as medical abnormalities. He said there was a day approaching where everyone would be considered sick and therefore their conduct pardonable. There would be no liability for human error, human choice, and willful conduct. Everyone would be innocent, vindicated through biology, psychiatry, and humanistic reasoning. Interesting book. Now, Minninger certainly understood those terms, terms like dysfunction, uh, terms like trauma, uh, terms like disorder and, and, and mental illness, but he, in a prescient way, predicted that there was, there was a, uh, a movement away from the whole idea of that we can define what's right and what's wrong. Miniature bemoaned the fact that there was no longer a moral compass, no fixed point, no determination of wrong behavior. Jesus here in this prayer, as he takes us from God being our father and us focusing on the kingdom and God being the one who provides us with our daily bread. Now he focuses on the need for us to look and, and grab onto this moral compass. 
Years ago when I was first starting to counsel married couples, I had a couple come in to see me. They were going through some very, very difficult times. And uh, I decided that I would do some individual work with both the husband and the wife. And when the, when the husband came in, especially the husband, um, it, was a, um, it was a session where he would just speak almost the entire uh, appointment time uh, about the state of their marriage and more to the point about how his wife's shortcomings had, had uh, bring them, brought them to a point where they, they just weren't uh, doing well at all in their marriage. This went on session after session and I began to, to, to try to push back a little bit and say, okay, that's, I, I understand that, but, but tell me, tell me where, where you are and what happens uh, when you respond in certain ways. Of course, I heard the same thing uh, from the wife as well. I found out that this husband uh, had, had a uh, problem with alcohol. He just didn't want to face it quite uh, yet in terms of his time with me. And the wife had a really, really tough time with her anger. She didn't want to face that either. So yes, addictive behavior, I understand as, as a counselor, has a biological component, but there's a willful component as well. But for this husband, it was his wife's fault. For the wife, it was her husband's fault and excused both of their anger and their inability to forgive and excused uh, lamentably their verbal abuse of each other. I have written a book on marriage. It's not a bestseller. I, I'm sorry to, to say that. Um, uh, it's called The Upside Down Marriage. I, I actually had it republished uh, just this last year and uh, was able to go through and re-edit some, some of the chapters that I wrote. They, they're all ironic chapter titles. But one of, the, one of the chapter titles is, Don't Be So Religious. And in that chapter, my whole point is that if you're going to heal relationships, you have to look at yourself first. You can't be pointing all the time at your spouse, your husband, your wife, your child, your parent, your employer, your employee, your friend. You have to start with self-focus. And Jesus, when he says, this is the way you pray, he says, this is your self-focus. You're not praying for other people's sins to be forgiven. You're praying for your own sins to be forgiven. Because if you don't come to grips with your own sin, you'll never be privileged and able to experience the forgiveness of God. If you don't come to grips with your own sin, you will never be able to experience the forgiveness of God. G.K. Chesterton, the prolific author, uh, a, a Christian, he, he was uh, quite famous in, in the early parts of the 20th century, just wonderful, wonderful books on theology and, and, and practical living. And he was once asked the question in an interview, what's wrong with the world? And of course, they wanted his, his philosophical view of the world and where the world has gone wrong. And I've used this quote several times before, and I'm going to use it again because I enjoy it so much. G.K. Chesterton, when asked that question, what's wrong with the world? He says, what's wrong with the world? He says, what's wrong with the world is me. What's wrong with the world is me. And what he was saying is, let's not worry about the world before I worry about myself. Richard Rohr defines sin in this way. I thought this was an interesting way of looking at it because we, we tend to codify it in our own particular way. He said, sins are fixations that prevent the energy of life, God's love, from flowing freely. They are self-erected blockades that cut us off from God and hence from our own authentic potential. Sin are our own fixations that block us from experiencing the love of God. I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful way of putting it. Remember, we prayed, Jesus said, the first thing, our Father in heaven, hallowed be, man, hallowed be your name. We will give you the glory. So contrary to contemporary wisdom and morality, you and I don't get to choose what's right and what's wrong. The Apostle Paul writes, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. All. So, here's another question for you. When... When's the last time you confessed your sins? And I'm not talking about the, the quick, oh, Lord, I'm sorry I did that, forgive me. I'm talking about you sitting down and you saying, okay, let's have a time 
where I, where I look at my life and confess my sins. The Apostle John writes 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've worked with scores of people that have benefited from going through the 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and, and that 12 steps toward conquering addictions. And, and uh, if you know anything about the 12-step process, there's a, there's a uh, step four. And the step four is, I think, one of the most dramatic turning points in that whole 12-step process because step four is after you realize that you're powerless to do it yourself, that you take a, what they call a thorough moral inventory where you take a long look at yourself and you say, where have I fallen short? So I, I suggest in, in this new year, instead of doing New Year's resolutions and starting out that way, that you perhaps start out in this way. In 2021, I would encourage you to, to take some time and have a time of confession. Where have I fallen short? And what do I need to confess. And I was doing a little application, pre-application of the sermon because I want to enter into my sermons. I thought, I, I need to do this as well. And I began to, to do an inventory of my own life, an inventory of where I was spiritually. And uh, I won't tell you all the sins that I confess, but one that really stood out to me was after 2020 and all the drama of 2020 as we've gone into 2021 and the continued drama. You know what one of my sins is? It's the sin of cynicism. I don't trust anybody anymore. I don't care whether you're a Republican, Democrat, progressive, conservative. I don't trust anybody. I'm, I'm cynical. I, I don't trust. And it skews my view of the people that I need to be able to pray for and to show God's love to. So, forgiveness is the first word. Second word, last word that we're going to talk about is the word freedom. Freedom. Jesus says, this is the way you pray. Okay, he's talking about forgive our debts. Now he says, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Okay, so there's a responsibility that when we forgive, we are then commanded, we're called to, if we're going to be effective prayers, we're called to extend that forgiveness to other people. Forgiven people forgive. And then he prays this curious phrase, and lead us not into temptation and goes on, but deliver us from evil. So Michael mentioned this last week. This prayer is a prayer of seven petitions and uh, we're really looking at the, the last four. But to this sixth petition, this lead us not into temptation, uh, I think is a direct result of the experience of the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is showing us that there's a call that's incumbent on everyone who's forgiven. It's not just the joy of being forgiven, but it's the call to living a new life, not just to extend forgiveness to others, but also to not fall back into our own sinful patterns. Jesus in Matthew 4 is coming out of a 40-day temptation where he experienced great, great agony and, and, and great temptation. And he is acknowledging the terrible time, I think, in this prayer of, of that time in the wilderness. One of the commentaries I read says, the words, these words lead us not to, into temptation, are a cry issuing from a deep sense of our personal weakness against the power of evil. Now, James tells us that God doesn't tempt us, so that's, a given. God's not the one who does the tempting. But Jesus is also saying that, that we can pray that God will guide us in our lives to make us safe from, from the pitfalls that can cause us to fall away from him and to do things that are displeasing to him. Later on in the book of Matthew, in the drama of the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is praying before his trial and his persecution and his crucifixion, Jesus prays, Lord, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And what he is praying is, is he, he's praying against being led into this temptation. And of course, the conclusion of that prayer was, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
But then two verses later, he goes to his disciples. Where are his disciples? His disciples, his disciples are there, but instead he's asked them to watch and pray with him, but they're sleeping. And Jesus goes to his disciples and he says, watch and pray. And here's the phrase, so that you will not fall into temptation. And as I was considering that text and then comparing it to what Jesus calls us to when he calls us to pray in this way, how much do I pray that I will not fall into temptation? And he concludes his comments to his disciples, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Prayer is is a movement from our own flesh-driven will to a spirit-empowered will. And prayer invites the spirit to take us to a place where we can resist being ones who disobey and not give God the glory with our actions. Jameson Fawcett Brown's commentary on that phrase, lead us not in temptation. I like this, it's, it's a prayer against being drawn or sucked of our own will into temptation. Which then leads us to the seventh petition, deliver us from evil or all the translations and all the Greek scholars say, really, it's, it needs to be translated, deliver us from the evil one. There is an enemy to your soul and my soul and we do ourselves a disservice if we don't realize that. Zach talked about this uh, two weeks ago when he said that God concentrates his attacks on fathers and or, or Satan co uh, concentrates his attacks on fathers and marriages and God allows us to pray our protection around these things. But we need to understand that, that we can experience deliverance, freedom from the evil one. That's the one who's our enemy. Eugene Peterson in his autobiography, The Pastor, he's uh, of course, uh, the author of, of the uh, paraphrased version of the Bible, The Message, just a wonderful man and a wonderful pastor. He talked about planting a church in, in this town in Maryland and uh, as he was getting uh, acclimated to this, this new location, he began to interact with other pastors and, and other people from different denominations. He, he befriended one of the mother superiors of a convent nearby and uh, had some delightful conversations with her and they were talking one day, visited her, and, and uh, she said to him, oh, you, you, you Protestants, you're really good at sin, but you're not very good at evil. And he says, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you talk about sin a lot, but you, you don't understand that there is an evil presence that we need to fight against all the time. She said, I walk around this convent and I pray that the enemy will, will remove his presence and his evil from ca causing discord and disharmony and to keep us away from the things that God has called us to. Freedom, freedom is what we're called to. It's not just enough to be forgiven. We're forgiven for a purpose. We're not forgiven just to keep being forgiven over and over again. The Bible talks about we don't sin so that grace can abound all the more. And we take, I take for granted my forgiveness, forgiveness far too often. As I worked with this couple, this couple that had all this discord and was pointing their fingers on each other. I remember vividly a session I had with, with the husband and he came in and um, he had had a, a, a really, really difficult weekend and a bout of drinking where some things happened that, that were destructive. And he was, he was convicted and he came in, he'd asked his wife for forgiveness and, and we talked about, about how he could then begin get his focus off his wife and onto himself so he could begin to live the life that he needed to live so he could lead his family in a way that it needed to be led. We finally talked about what it would be like for him to move on in a healthy way. But confession is just the first step. The goal is deliverance. To understand you're a sinner and to ask for forgiveness is, is, is a wonderful step toward God but we are called to more than that. We're called to deliverance. So what are you asking from God? What are you praying for? After confession comes supplication, petition, 
my call for you, and really the call is to me as well, to not allow your own weaknesses, my own weaknesses, to suck me back into sin, to look at forgiveness in a cavalier way, if that's always available, and it really doesn't matter what I do. It matters what I do. It matters what you do. We're called to be delivered from the evil one and his devastating attacks. Uh, my life as, as this young child reading the top of our refrigerator, the money there. Uh, so my life as a thief and, a, and now I was a money launderer uh, was ended one morning when uh, once again I'd raided uh, this little cache of, of coins and, and small bills. Uh, I, I, I sort of gathered uh, my lo own little, little uh, stash and of course my brothers now knew that I was doing this so I called both of them. They are now both involved in this. I said, let's go. I didn't do it right then. I said, let's go to the basement. I never, never we went down to, to the smallest room in our basement. It's my dad's eight by eight little workshop and I went in there and that's where we were gonna to, to share this, this ill-gotten gain. And I, I remember looking at my brothers and they're looking at me and I'm, I'm parceling out this, these coins. And uh, my brother, Tom, began looking over my shoulder and began to laugh. And uh, that wasn't a good sign. And I said, what, what, what is so funny? And it was a nervous laughter. And I looked over my shoulder and there was my mother. My mother staring down at us, caught red-handed in this, this awful behavior. I was in need of forgiveness. I don't remember what happened so much. I think my mother was pretty gracious in her forgiveness. But see, beyond that, from that day and all throughout my, my life, I wasn't just in need of forgiveness. I was in need of freedom from my own selfish and yes, evil desires. See, forgiveness without freedom leads to futility. So as you go into 2021, I would encourage you to begin this year, we're a few weeks into it, begin this year with a time of confession where you can experience God's forgiveness then also experience his call to the freedom that he provides for us through his spirit and his power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this prayer. Thank you for this call. And I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters who are listening to this, that you, by your spirit, would call us into a season of confession and a season where we could be committed to not just experiencing your forgiveness, but experiencing your freedom. Allow us to take that forgiveness and to forgive others. Help us to take that forgiveness and pray that we wouldn't be led into areas where we're weak and that we'd be praying against those things in our lives. And above that, Lord, I pray that the evil one would be one that has no influence on our lives, that we'd be, we'd be protected and that we'd be freed from his oppression. Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for what he's done for us. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made for us so we could be forgiven people. We rejoice in that and we rejoice in you, the God whom we glorify. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Thank you for those words. I know I needed that. I needed that reminder of God's love for us, of God's forgiveness, and his hope that it drives us forward, that there is such a deep well of hope and care there that happens. And um, as we wrap up the service and as you partake in communion, I hope you'll be reminded of the nearness of God to you and his provision and his promises and his even physical sustenance in the midst of all of that as well. Um, again, you can find uh, resources around communion linked below as they're helpful for you. If we can pray for you, please let us know. It's linked below. Send them in. We love praying for you throughout the week. But as we conclude this service, hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in God's peace. This service has ended. <laughs>